May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be always acceptable to you, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Please be seated. Blessed are you who weep now, for you will laugh. Woe to you who are laughing now, for you will mourn and weep. In 2005, I had just finished my master's degree and I'd already started working towards my dissertation and my PhD in math. Things were going well. I was in the groove of school. I had my research topic together. I was all in it. I was teaching classes that I had already taught before. I was comfortable. But in August of that year, Hurricane Katrina hit New Orleans, my hometown. That semester in school year was a wash. I don't really remember much from that year. I, and really, I started to think about my life. Was getting my PhD in math really what I wanted to do? The following May, my mom was diagnosed with breast cancer. We were in New Orleans. We didn't even know if we could stay in New Orleans if the hospitals were open. And all I wanted to do at that point was quit grad school, move back to New Orleans, and be with my mom. I didn't know where life was going. I felt so lost. I had gone from that state of laughing to mourning and weeping. I felt so lost and didn't know what to do. But I also realized, started to realize that continuing to do math just didn't seem right for me. But not knowing what else to do, I continued on in graduate school. In 2008, I graduated with my PhD. But the whole time, I felt God was calling me to something different. I was the crazy one that decided to go through a discernment process and write a dissertation at the same time was a smart idea. For the professors in the room, you know about writing a dissertation. There are many tears and the many times of banging your head against the wall and thinking, what am I doing? For the students who have gone, those gone through a discernment process, those same exact things are going through your head. What the heck am I doing? But it was during that time, again, so many tears were shed during that process. But it was only through God's help that I was only able to realize the strength that I had and also able to get through that years. I wouldn't have been able to do it without God. Woe to you who are laughing now, for you will mourn and weep. There is never a truer statement in my life than working my way through graduate school. But this story helps me to relate to Luke's version of the Beatitudes a little bit more. The Beatitudes, they're something familiar to all of us. I think most of us are more familiar with Matthew's version, and it's part of the Sermon on the Mount. However, Luke's version is different. You hear the four blesseds immediately followed by four woes. Now, a little bit of background. The word blessed comes from the Greek word makarios, which means fortunate, well-off, or happy. It's nice to hear that word. On the other hand, the four woe statements are eye-opening. Woe is a striking word, which is the complete intention of the author. Today, we think of the word woe as something bad, unhappy, cursed, or damned. But woe here is used as a contrast of the blessings. It comes from the word, word, Greek word uai, which is an exclamation of grief or alas. It's meant to strike a difference from the word blessed that we hear earlier. But no wonder we like to think of Matthew's version better. It has blessing, eight blessings. Blessings are happy. But the more I spend time with these verses in Luke, the more I begin to love them. These verses in Luke are part of Luke's Sermon on the Plain, whereas Matthew has the Sermon on the Mount. These verses, as we heard yesterday, are follow the naming of the 12 disciples. In these verses, Jesus is among the disciples and a great crowd of people from Judea, Jerusalem, and the coast of Tyre and Sidon. 
Luke makes it clear that Jesus is on the same level with those around him. This is part of Luke's theme throughout the gospel of leveling the playing field and the role of reversals, which is very clear in these statements. These four human conditions described here of poverty, hunger, weeping, and defamation are seen, are seen as blessings and values. And then today, we usually th it's usually the opposite that we see as desirable. Again, that is the point the author is making. But woe to you who are rich, for you have received your common consolation. Jesus isn't telling us it's a bad thing to be rich, but I think Jesus is telling us that the kingdom of God is all around us. Some that are poor and some that are rich. Each one of us is a child of God. There will be times we might be hungry, weeping, defamed, but that's okay. We are still a child of God and God loves us no matter what. Jesus wants us to think deeper about what the kingdom of God looks like. What really matters is not the material things, but the relationships with each other and with God. This message from Jesus to the crowd, these blessings and these curses. Again, he just named the 12 disciples. They are orders for them and everyone else following Jesus. According to N.T. Wright, this will mean good news for all the people who haven't had any for a long time. The poor, the hungry, those who weep, those who are hated, blessings on them. But when injustice is reigning, the world will have to be turned once more the right way up for God's injustice and kingdom to come to birth. These verses not only help me remember my experiences, but reminds me of humanity and how I see God in new ways each and every day. It allows me to see God in the blessings and the woes in this gospel. The kingdom of God is for everyone, not just the elites, but to see God in each person around me. There are going to be times each of us are going through rough times, and maybe our friends are on those highs, but no matter where we are in our journey, we are always searching for God. And Jesus reminds us here that we have not arrived yet. It's easy for me to look at the four blessings when I'm currently not in that position to see the other side of things. I'm not there. However, I think many of us have been on both sides of the coin before in various times of our life. Currently, I'm a grad student, I'm a seminarian. I don't have a lot of money, or really much at all. But I do, when I see the, those of unhoused neighbors, it reminds me that I do have more than I think. And maybe those that are struggling financially, how can I help them? More importantly, these verses remind me that God is in each and every one of us. What is God calling you to do? To help those that are less fortunate and might need a little extra help. In the end, it doesn't matter how much money we have or how many possessions we have or don't have, but it's creating the relationships with those around us. To sit with the people when they are weeping to share some of your food when they are hungry, to stand up for those who can't stand up for themselves. Jesus, we are to follow Jesus and to follow and to follow or find God's kingdom. We also are called to do justice for the poor and the most humiliated. Now, Hurricane Katrina brought out a lot of indifferences that we saw not only existing in New Orleans, we see in the world around us and in the country. But through the tragedy and many tears, there was joy that came out of it. Everybody came together to help each other 
and to build back a stronger and better city. I remember neighbors were helping neighbors and it didn't matter where they were. In September of 2006, so 13 months after Katrina hit, ripped through New Orleans and the Mississippi Gulf Coast, the Saints returned to the Superdome for the first time on the same field that you saw those images of these people dying, looking for food, finding water, finding their family, or just looking to get out of the city and to be rescued. That night to watch the Saints play in the Superdome was a rebirth for the city of New Orleans. All around the country, all around the city, everybody was watching that TV. And those that were not in the city and couldn't return or never did return home, they were watching that game. The Saints brought hope to that city. But one thing that I saw that I will never forget is that night brought people together for one moment, for those three hours of a football game. It didn't matter whether they were rich or poor, black or white, it didn't matter. That one night of football brought the city together. But more importantly, it gave me a glimpse of what the kingdom of God looks like. My prayer for us is to continue to see God and each and everyone around us, and that together we can catch glimpses of the kingdom of God. Amen.